got some meat stew. Praise the Lord, everyone. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? If you believe it, why don't you stand to your feet right now? Let's put our hands together. Let's start out this day with worship and praise of our Savior. He is a good God. We are grateful, my Savior, for one more opportunity. We're grateful for one more chance, God, to enter into your presence, Lord Jesus, uh, to make a joyful noise, my God, to receive from your word, Lord. Uh, you are good in all your ways. Uh, there is none above you. There is none beside you. None came before, nor is any coming after. You are the great I am. Uh, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Sid Canoe. Uh, you are all of this and so much more. You are my king, my redeemer. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. God is a good God. I'm so grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. What a word we heard last night. Amen. What a word we received from God last night. I, I was contemplating, and as I, I watched all of the musicians and the singers and the worship that, that, that was going forth, I, I was rejoicing in my spirit. I, I enjoyed that. But thank God that the word, listen to me, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word. I, I don't know about you. I, I want to hear the songs. and I, I, I'm Puerto Rican, man. You give me a rhythm, and I'll get going with it. But dear God, it's not in the rhythm. It's not in the shimmy shake. It's in the word of God because it's that word that the Bible says he has magnified above all his name. It's the word that'll see you through the tough times. It's the word that'll help you in those times of doubt. It's the word that'll help you in the times of brokenness. God, give me your word. And we're going to receive the word of God today. We're so excited that you are here. We're going to have three different sessions. My responsibility is to make sure you get to where you need to be. We have the licensed minister, Brother Jones, is going to be with them downstairs. So if you are a licensed minister right now, leave where you're at. Head downstairs. There will be people in the hallway that will direct you where you need to go. 
At the same time, the young men are going to be ministered to by Brother Peterson, again, downstairs. So if you would leave where you're at right now, head to the hallway. We'll direct you where you need to go. And then Brother Reading is going to be ministering here in the sanctuary, the general session. We're excited about what God is doing. God is good. Amen? Why don't you turn around, shake hands with a neighbor, tell them how happy you are to see them in the house of God today. You love a guy that turns the mic off. Praise the Lord, gentlemen. Why don't you clap your hands if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on, how many's glad to be in the house of the Lord today? How many enjoyed the word of God last night? The worship, amen. God is so good, amen. If you would remain standing, we would like to bring to this platform today an incredible man of God, a very dear friend of mine, someone that's been in uh, Indiana all of his life, pastors an amazing church in Greenfield, and uh, I'm telling you, you are in for a, an incredible, incredible blessing, an incredible treat today. Pastor John Reading is going to come and minister to us. Amen. Let's put our hands together and let's open our minds and hearts for the Word of God. Amen. Come on, could we worship the Lord for just a moment? Give him the glory that he is worthy of, exalting him in this house. Amen, 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 amen. God is good. He is great. We are thankful for him and what he's done. You may be seated. Amen. I want to give a shout of thanks to the men's committee for the privilege here to speak to our district leadership their support. Pastor Carson, who has graciously allowed me to uh, share in this pulpit. And uh, what a word we heard last night. Is that not incredible, challenging, and what a wonderful thing we have heard. Thankful for a group of men that are here from our church, Greenfield Faith Apostolic, and their, their uh, faithfulness, and uh, grateful for many friends in this room and most of all, for the presence of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to turn your attention to the book of Luke, uh, the 16th chapter, and uh, we will read from the 10th verse. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. The Bible says that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Allow me just to emphasize that again. He that is faithful in the least is faithful also in much. We have in Scripture, also in the book of Luke, a parable. The one who was the Word made flesh and dwelling among us used the same voice to utter words to his followers and his disciples, things that would bring the eternal and the kingdom to life around them. He would point off into a field and give them an example using the one who is plowing or working the fields to show them some great, wonderful truth. He would also use storytelling because his audience was vast and he was speaking into their spirit using stories that they could receive to imprint upon them the profound truths that he was speaking. And so it is in the book of Luke, we hear that story, the parable that he shares that we know as the parable of the prodigal parable, the prodigal has a cast of characters, most notable of which is the prodigal himself, whom the Bible tells us that he took 
and squandered literally half of their family possessions. Thankfully, it goes on to tell us of his awakening, of his returning, and we are so thankful for that. Amen. The father who anticipated his son's return and waited upon him and received him with generosity and forgiveness. And also in this cast of characters is the eldest brother who remained and never wandered, but yet was filled with bitterness just the same. The Bible tells us, however, in Luke 15, verses 22 and 23, that the father said unto his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and a ring upon his hand and shoes on his feet. And verse 23 says, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Today, our focus is not on these notorious characters of which we have heard oft and again. But today, I want to speak to you about one in this parable that is the unknown. For the Bible tells us there was a servant of the father who kept the calf ready. And today, I wish to speak to you for a few moments about the keeper of the calf. The keeper of the calf. Amen. In scripture, speaking of the fatted calf, it is not simply the fattest of the flock or the fattest of the herd, but it is specifically the fatted calf. In other words, it was not the best of many, but it was one that had been specifically set apart. At some early time, it had been inspected. It had been looked over and realized that this is one that we can nurture for a special occasion. It was cut out of the herd. It was separated. It would be kept in its own place within the barn. It would be fed a particular diet, and it was saved for a rare and special occasion. Nobody knew when it was set aside what it would be used for, but they understood there would come a time when they would need a celebration that exceeded all others, and so somebody was given the task of being the steward of the fatted calf. They were, they were the one that would uh, keep it within its pen, that would keep it separate, that would nurture it. In this culture of which we speak, agricultural nature of this people, the flocks that would be tended upon the far-flung fields and those who would wander the hills of the countryside enjoying the fresh air and the beauty of nature while they tended the flocks of their master. This one, the keeper of the calf, would not know such things. Never knowing the, uh, the roaming of the far ranges, never knowing what it was like to spend a beautiful evening under the starry skies upon the rolling hills of the countryside. Was it not David himself who having experienced such things said that the shepherd would, could be found lying in the green pastures along with the sheep, the flocks, and the animals that he tended or there beside the still waters. The keeper of the calf would not know the freedom of roaming such places, but there in the barn, there in the stalls, there in the shadows, in the darkness of the structure, would he continually, daily, constantly take care of this calf, never having perhaps experienced such a celebration that they were anticipating at some distant day, not, not ever realizing the importance of what he was doing, but simply 
due to faithfulness would he stay at his station simply due to faithfulness would he remain uh, glued to his purpose simply because he was given a job to do and it was unto him to keep faithful at what he was called would he stay there in the shadow of the stall Amen. Among the great enterprises of this family farm, this task might seem insignificant. Can we just take a moment and suppose that his human nature was akin to ours as well? That there's something within us when we continue in what appears to be the mundane. That something inside of us reconciles the continuance of our day. And we begin to wonder what is the purpose of our task? What is the use of what we're doing? This has been a day in and a day out, uh, a, a job that we have been given. But does it really matter? What's the use of what I'm doing? When, when he would see the flocks that would grow, when he would hear of successful days at the market, when we, he would behold his brethren in what they were doing and what did your day consist of? I just kept the calf. I just gave it another meal. I just made sure that it did not bruise itself. I just stayed in the stall another day with that one calf. The Bible tells us that even the psalmist himself began to wonder as he played the cymbals day in and day out in the house of God. As he saw the prosperity of the wicked as they went by. What is the purpose of this routine thing that I am doing? Is there any value at all to what I am? The Bible tells us, amen, that this is the nature of our our humanity and I believe that no doubt there are individuals in this house today that you are watching the sands of time slip through the hourglass of your life wondering what is the purpose of your existence what is the meaning of your calling what is the reason behind what you are doing faithfully and consistently and does it even matter perhaps there are those in this place today that you feel like the keeper of the calf who was unknown, who was unrecognized, and whose job was literally inglorious. Amen. But I'm thankful today for what we heard last night because there are men that have risen to the occasion that are doing what God has called them to do, that are doing what is important to do regardless of the glory that it engenders, regardless of the recognition that might or might not come your way. But I'm thankful today to stand before faithful men who are consistently 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 doing what God has called you to do I'm talking about men in this house that show up early to church find a place to pray I'm talking about men that will come off the pew with hands lifted putting them together and making the praises of God glorious I'm talking about men that will lead in worship men that will lead in giving men that will lead in the work of the kingdom and men that will be faithful in what they are called to do. Amen. My message today is in honor of such that are here in this house, workmen in the shadows, workmen in the shadows, perhaps without position or title. Perhaps without a name somewhere posted within the building to let everybody know how valuable you are. Somebody that's working while the others seem to get all the attention. And I'm not trying to engender strife here, but wondering if anybody even knows you're there. And would anybody even notice if you left? 
Because there's something within our nature we need to be noticed, and yet there's some jobs that just have a hard time being seen by the casual observer. Amen. There are some jobs that are difficult to be recognized on a daily basis, and it's within our nature to wonder if what we do even matters. But I'm thankful for men that continue in what you're doing regardless if anybody ever sees it, regardless if anybody ever pats you on the back for it, regardless if anybody ever calls your name out before the crowds and says thank you for what you're doing. You are indispensable and we could not make it without you, but you show up and you do it anyway and you do it faithfully, continuously, daily without ceasing. Thank God today for those in this house that are the keepers of the cat. Somebody in this house might wonder if recognition, if position and title, if all of the things that our flesh screams for is not easily and often handed out, where does the dedication to continue in this sort of operation come from? What is the motivation and where does that drive, uh, where does it, where is it birthed? Can I take you to the book of Psalms in chapter 84? For the psalmist writes there, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord God Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are they who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. For better is a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And I would rather be a doorkeeper. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. There is something that has welled up with inside some of you gentlemen that say, I know what the house of God means to me. If you will allow me to elaborate for a moment on this inglorious task that these gentlemen are writing about for this psalm is attributed to the sons of Korah who were from their very beginnings the doorkeepers of the house of God. They were the gatekeepers. They were the keepers of the passageway. And what that means to us as we read through the scriptures, uh, just simply blurring through the pages may not resound, but yet what we understand is this was not the most sought after after job it was not the most prestigious it was not the most recognized often done within the shadows and yet the sons of Korah wrote this beautiful passage because they were celebrating the position in which they found themselves but there was some history to it 400 years 450 years prior to the psalm being written. Their father, Korah, his associates, and 250 others gathered themselves together and went against Moses and Aaron. They brought up railing charges and accusations against the leaders that the Lord himself had chosen. Korah was Moses' cousin, and he come to him with the attitude of, why is it that you get to do what you do? Why do you get to go to the mountain and hear God? 
Why do you get to see the face of God and come and tell us that I have seen God and thus is what he said? Moses, don't you understand that we are as capable as climbing the mountain as you are? We are as capable of hearing the voice of God. And Moses, you literally take too much upon yourself. You have exalted yourself. You have put yourself in a high position. The Bible tells us, amen, that they railed against Moses withstanding him. Moses had an interesting retort. He reminded them that God had chosen and called them. You are the gatekeepers. You are the doorkeepers of the house of God. Written in his response is something that we need to hear and take heart today as he reminded them that God has chosen to use you and you think that what you're doing is too small for you. Their job, being the doorkeeper or the keeper of the passageway, seemed to have no apparent prestige. But it positioned them in a way that they had failed to recognize. Because what they did, Moses is admonishing them, put them nearer to the presence of the Lord in the holies of holies than anyone in the kingdom or except for the priests themselves that would go before the Lord on a yearly basis. He tried to appeal to their senses. Man, do you not understand that what you have been called to do in this shadows has put you closer to the presence of God than anything else that anybody is doing in this place just because it's more obvious just because their work seems to be more impressive they may have the prestige but you have the presence can I tell you that you are never closer to the presence of God than when you're willing to work in the shadows because the Bible tells me that he put upon himself no glory, but he came unrecognizable to do the greatest job that this world had ever seen. I'm telling you, sir, if you work in the shadows and nobody ever knows your name, but if you are near the presence of God, you have the greatest position in all the church. Show up and be grateful. Show up and be glad that he has put you in a place so near and dear the heart of God himself. Moses is flabbergasted at his cousin. You know how close you are to God. But you're angry and rebelling because you want something with a little more flash and flair. And so God got involved. You ever wonder... You ever wonder why the judgment that came upon Korah and his cohorts was so severe? At first, Moses is saying, God, sick him. And then when God got mad, Moses was like, hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. Kind of like my mom. She'd get mad at me, get riled up, and then she'd get my dad riled up. And then when he got riled up, she'd say, hold on, bud. You're going to kill him. <laughs> and God's saying, get back. Everybody, stand back. Move out of the way. Because if you're anywhere close to him, you're going to be consumed with him. An incredible thing happened. Literally, the ground itself split wide open. And it consumed not just the 250 men of this evil council, but it consumed everything that pertained to them, everything that belonged to them, 
everything that was attached to them, everything that was related to them. And there was a horror that came upon the people that it unsettled the entire nation of the Hebrews because of, of the, the violence by which this rebellious uprising was quenched. But God said, I will not have that. I, I, I personally believe it was more than just the fact that they disrespected Moses. I think it was more than just the fact uh, that they had risen up in rebellion. I think it was something about the fact that they had been so near his presence for so long, but they could not recognize it for what it was. And they were willing to trade the presence of God for prestige. I'm, a, I'm appealing to somebody in this house that we serve a merciful God and we serve a gracious Savior. But when we cross the line that we are more interested in prestige, we are more interested in recognition. We are more interested in the credit that will come to our name than the presence of God that we have entertained. God said, that is a seed that I will not let grow in my garden, lest it spread to the men beside you, lest it spread to the household nearby you, because God will not tolerate those in that spirit that says, I'd rather have prestige than the presence of the Lord. And so it is that we have gathered in this house today and I've come to tell you that the sons of Korah who wrote in this psalm and said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. They were speaking from the experience of their own household some several centuries before. But whoa, you said that everything that pertained to them, their households, etc. was consumed in the violence occurrence of God's judgment. But we find in that passage in a later verse, uh, it says, but the sons of Korah, the children of Korah perish not in numbers 26 and 11. And I wish to paint for you a scene right now that will help establish uh, the spirit that they had later in the Psalm. For you see after the dust had settled, and the earth had closed itself up over everything that they had ever known. These group, this, this group of young men, the children of Korah, found themselves in a very odd position. We are talking about a culture and a people that were identified solely by who their father was. Bartimaeus is the son of Timaeus. And on we understand that you were tied to the identity of your parentage. And when the dust had settled that day and, and the people of God were in disarray, there huddled amongst them a group of men that had no home to go back to. They had no tent to return to. They had no father to go back and sit at his feet and learn the wisdom. Where would they go? For they were pariahs within the kingdom. They were orphaned in the turmoil of the destruction. And where would they return when everybody had slid back to their tents, were, were, were restless in the night, wondering what had just happened? This cluster of young men had nowhere to go. But here's what I believe. I believe they found refuge in the house of God itself because we read their words that says, yea, even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for itself where she may have her young. Even a place near your altars, O oh Lord. I think somewhere in the night that huddled mass of young men that had nowhere to return. Some priest said, I, I I know where you can lay your head. I know where you will belong. When everybody's pretending you don't exist when you walk by, when nobody wants to meet your eye for what has happened, I've got a place that you can come and rest. And there they found in the house of God a refuge and a 
sanctuary. I preach to you, my friend, that I am the son of Korah that found a place of refuge, sanctuary, hiding and holding in the house of God. It was the altars of the Lord that became my sanctuary when I didn't know where to run and did not know where to turn. And I believe I'm speaking to individuals in this house today that if it not have been for the house of God, where would we be? Where would we be? Where would we be? But thankfully, God gave us a place of mercy and a place of safety to run to. Where could I go but to the Lord? After a, a very traumatic experience, when I was a child, I fled from my home. I ran. I, I, I didn't want anybody to find me. I, I needed a sanctuary. I needed a safe place. And, and in, in my lost moment, I didn't know where to go, but I found a place. So my family realized, and where, where's John? They began to look around, and they began to look here and there. Some of them went to the park. Let's see if we can find his bike. Maybe he rode to the park. Maybe rode to one of the people in the church or a friend and so they began to scatter and they began to look and yet it was one of my sisters who just seemed to have a no, the knowledge of my heart and, and, and even as a child uh, she come not, not down the street to the park, not down to the school or to a friend's house but she pulled into the church property and she went to the place where I'd hidden myself, where I'd buried myself deep, don't let anybody find me and I still hear her voice in my mind. John, are you here? John, where are you, babe? John, it's okay. You're going to be safe. There's nothing going to happen to you. John, it's all right to come out. Where did I go in that hour where I didn't know where else I could go? I'd went to the church. It was the only place I knew. It was the safest place I could find. And I can tell you today, that was not the last time that I found refuge in the house of God. But I can tell you of time after time after time that I went down the aisleway and crawled under the altars and buried myself in those carpets and said, God, I'm not going to get up until you touch me, until you help me, until you heal me, until you bless me. I'm not moving till I can hear your voice. I'm not moving until you reach me. I'm not moving until you save me. And you're here today. Day, and you're here today and you're here today because of the house of God and the refuge that it has been to you. We've taken our children to the altars. We've taken our marriage to the altars. We've taken our finances to the altars. We've taken every bit of our being to the altars because it is a sanctuary and a haven of safety. And the sons of Korah, sons of Korah, I don't need anyone's accolades. I don't need anybody's attention. I don't need anybody to see me in the shadows because there's something about being in proximity to the presence. I'd rather be the doorkeeper don't you ever, don't you have any ambition? Don't you ever want to be more? I'd rather be the doorkeeper. Don't you have any desires, you know, to be known and to be uh, recognized? I'd rather be the doorkeeper. Uh, I came through those gates one day. I came through those doors one day. I'd rather be the doorkeeper. I want to see a hungry soul. I want to see a hurting soul. I want to see somebody running for their life. I want to see somebody desperate that's trying to make it. And I'm going to hold the door open for them. And I'm going to keep the passageway clear. I want to see somebody with desperation in their eyes like I had. You don't have to put me in a position of elevation because from where I'm standing, I can see the hurting coming. I can see the hungry coming. I can see the desperate coming. And I'll hold the door. You can make it. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. Bring your family here. There's a place for you. There's a place where you belong. I see the nest where the least of the birds has built its nest. And if God will save the least, 
He will save you. Devil's been playing in your mind. You deserve more. Nobody, nobody knows what all you do around here. Devil's been playing in your mind. They're taking advantage of you. They're using you. You give your time, you give your money, you give your energy, you give your passion. Ain't nobody calling your name out. Ain't nobody telling everybody how much you are worth to this church. Ain't nobody noticing how much you matter. And here you are again. First one through the door, first one in the prayer room, first one in the altar. Do they even know who you are? Does anybody even care that you're here? I'm telling you, the devil's lying to somebody today. The devil's lying to somebody today. Devil's lying to somebody today. You need to realize I was given a job. It may be different than anybody else's. Ain't nobody else having to do what I'm having to do, but I'm given a job because there's something that's going to happen someday. We've heard about it. They've told us revival's coming. They've told us that we're going to see an outpouring like we've never seen before. They've told us about things that we've heard it so long that we begin to wonder if it's ever going to happen. But I've come to tell somebody somebody in this house, that calf that you're keeping prepared, that one that you're keeping separated, that one that has been anticipated. We're going to have a celebration for the Bible tells us that even heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. I've come to tell you that there's a party that's coming to your community. There's a celebration that's coming to your church that somebody's going to look around and say, where's the calf? Where's the calf? Who's kept it fatted? Who kept kept it prepared. Uh, who kept it ready? Uh, you're going to step out of the shadows. Uh, you're going to bring it to the forefront. Uh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank uh, God that there was a keeper in the calf uh, that was in the shadows, not minded the glorious nature of the job that God called you to do. Because when they come, and heaven starts rejoicing, you will not mind the many lost hours in the darkness of the stable. See, the devil's lying to you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove it for a moment. But the Bible says the keeper had favor. Get your Bibles out, start flipping through the pages and try and find it. You say, I don't see that. Let's read between the lines. Let's read between the lines. Let's go to the strange place, to the foreign land to which the son had went. And the Bible says he, he squandered all that he had and he lost it in riotous living. And, and, and a famine came upon the land and all the people that he had fed and partied with, none of them would provide for him. And so he sold himself to a citizen of the land. He literally enslaved himself and his father would have to redeem him and buy him back. So signifying the robe, the ring, and the, and, and, and the shoes. But may I tell you, my friend, amen, that there was something that began to happen there in that sty when he was feeding the hogs and, 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 and he was looking in obviously at their food and realizing he was starving for the Bible says nobody would feed him. The Bible says, and he came to himself. I promise you, my friend, that you've got some prodigals and you've got some loved ones and it may be your wife. It, it may be your children. It may be your mother or your father, but there's somebody today that's far from God in your life and they are coming to themselves. They are having a realization of their need for God. I, I, I want somebody to, to, to realize there's a purpose. Amen. But, but, but can I tell you that he came to himself and in doing so, the Bible tells us that he said, I'm going to return to my father's home. I'm going to return to my father. I don't deserve to be called a son 
but maybe he'll let me be a servant. Here's where we read between the lines. For the next thing he says, for even my father's servants are blessed. They've got plenty. They eat well. They've got everything they have need of. How did the son who possibly lived in opulence, uh, who was, was blessed uh, in his father's household, how did he have the ability to come to himself and, and return? He understood within himself that he could not be a son any longer. Thank God for the mercies of the father that would undo that sort of thinking. But he recognized and realized uh, that I could at least be a servant because the servants of my father's house are blessed with plenty. Could it be that as he went through the barn day after day, maybe saddling his horses, he would see he would see that stall where the where 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 the uh, where the calf was kept. He would see that faithful servant who would come in and go out day by day. He never knew the name of the servant. He never knew who the the keeper of the calf was, but he saw him strong. He saw him blessed. He saw him well fed in his father's house. And here's what I need somebody to know. It was not the riches of his father's house that compelled him to return home. It wasn't my father's house has many rooms and I can get my room back. It wasn't the well-spread table that I'll sit at the head with my father and be restored. It wasn't the hallways that he could luxuriate in and wander through. But he said, there's something about my father's servants. Allow me, if you will, to expound on this a moment. I have never in my life, in the 20 some years I've pastored or working in the church where I've been I have never had somebody in the store or on the street come to me and say hey how's that building going I've never had somebody come and say are the pillars still holding their, their beautiful place is the instruments still well tuned are the, are, the, uh, are the players are they as practiced as they ever have been is the choir as beautiful as it's always was before I've never had anybody ask that when they were considering returning to the house of God but I can tell you what I've heard over and over and over again. Hey, Brother Reading, I just got to know, is Brother Jesse still there? Is Sister Betty still there? Are, who are they? I'm not talking about some great person in our church with a list of accolades to their name, titles, or positions, but I'm talking about precious people that just showed up at the church every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every morning. They'd come to the church and pray every day, every day, every day. I would come to my office, I would go to the church, and I would see their walker trails as they were pushing the walkers through the snow up the ramp because they were coming to the house of God to pray. And they would pray every day. I would walk through the building, and I would hear their cry, God, bless my pastor. God, save this city. And it's those kind of people. That the prodigals want to know, are they still there? Who are they? They're the keepers of the calf. Build your buildings, grow your programs, do all that you can to impress the masses, but it's not going to bring one prodigal home. But I'll tell you what will every time. It's faithful people that won't quit. It's faithful people that can be counted on because the prodigals are not hoping that everything is changed in their absence. The prodigals are hoping that when they come home, they're going to find some things are still there that they left. Is it a praying church? Is it a faithful church? Is it a consistent church? And it cannot be any of those things without men and women who are willing to be the keepers of the calf.
How do I get to hold this office? It's not appointed. You're not going to be ordained to it. You just got to show up and do it. Get a key from the pastor. What do you need it for? I just want to come and pray. I want to get on my face before God. I want to get there early before anyone else. Not that I can get the recognition for it. I just want to keep it ready for what is coming. Stand all over this house if you would, please. Even my father's servants have plenty. The world around you recognizes the blessings and the favor of God even when you can't see it, even when you don't feel it, even when the shadows chill your soul and you feel neglected and forgotten. The world remembers there's a blessing on that man. There's something about that person what is it? It's your proximity to the presence, and that will always trump a position of prestige. I'll just put it this way. You will never be recognized or have a position of prestige if you cannot understand the value of the presence. There's people watching. There's precious souls. They see you come. They see you drive in. They see your faithfulness. They see your consistency. But if no one else does, Matthew 25 and 21 tells us, and the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Moses asked his cousin, is this thing too little for you? Is it not big enough or grand enough for your ego? Is it beneath you? Are you too big for the job that you've been given? And the Lord says, thou hast been faithful over the few things, and I will make you ruler over the many. Sir, your job may seem inglorious and even at times inconsequential, but it's not the eyes of man that are upon you that matters. It's the Lord above. For only he can reward. I can give you a plaque, but what does that matter? I can give you some neat name to tag on to your bio, but what does that matter? We can have a day in your honor and celebrate you, but in the end of time, what does that matter? Nothing compared to the one who said, I watched how you took care of the little things. I wish to God somebody in this house today that you've swept the floors, you've cleaned some toilets, you've mowed some yards, you made sure the light bulbs were changed, you made sure there's somebody that's going to go home from this conference. You may not be sitting in a steakhouse this afternoon, but you may be scraping the barnacles off of a baptismal that somebody can get baptized in the name of the Lord. And while you're working and while you're toiling on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon, you wonder, does this even matter? I'm telling you, we need the keeper of the calf because somebody. <laughs> Sir, they're calling your name. The father is asking who's been keeping the calf. Where's he at? Where's he at? I'm looking over this congregation. Who are you today? The one that's almost disillusioned and wondering if what you're doing is worth it. Come on, I'm asking you, be faithful, 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 be faithful. 
I'll leave you with this closing remark. There's no other metric that I can find in Scripture. And I give honor to our incredible speaker, Brother Jones, for bringing this to my attention in a message he preached here in Indiana many years ago. There's no other metric by which we will be measured in ministry other than this. Were you faithful? The question will not be asked at the time of your reward. How many did you pastor? How many did you pray through? It will not be how many people sat on your pews. How many people called you their leader? The only question that will be asked of you that will linger for all of eternity was were you faithful? want us to lift our hands all over this place right now. Let's, let's just receive this word that Brother Reading just gave us. Come on, every man, every man here today, lift your hands, open your heart, and just receive into your spirit everything that God just gave you in the name of Jesus. Come on, keepers. Come on, keepers. Receive it into your spirit right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It's not about a position. It's not about a title. I want to be a keeper. Let's give Brother Reading a great big hand right now. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. The other sessions are coming in. We're about to go into our general session today. Amen. Just briefly greet one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you.